Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Telescope Talk Pro. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and it's been a while. It's been a while since we've done one of these, but today we are going to be talking about adaptive optics and the extremely large telescope. My guest today is an expert in astronomical instr instrumentation. He's going to share what we know about the uh, what's going on with the extremely large telescope, in particular about adaptive optics. And if you don't know what that is, stay tuned. You'll find out. Now, just a little background for those of you who don't know. The extremely large telescope will be one of the world's largest optical uh, infrared and uh, near-infrared telescopes, and it is now under construction. And it's part of the European Southern Observatory, and it's located on the top of Cerro Am Amazones, I hope I said that right, in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. Have you noticed a pattern here? Most of the new observatories are being built up in the Atacama Desert in Chile because they have some of the darkest, driest skies uh, we've ever that in the world. So the design consists of a, which it's a reflecting telescope. And get this, extremely large is not just some name, 39 Point three meters in diameter. And for you Americans who live in an alternate reality, it's 130 feet. Uh, it's got a segmented primary mirror, uh, and it's got a 4.2 meter uh, secondary mirror. And it will be supported by the adaptive optics that we're going to be talking about, eight laser guide star units, and multiple large science instruments, all, all kinds of stuff. And the observatory aims to gather 100 million times more light than the human eye, which is 13 times more light than the largest optical telescopes existing so far. Uh, and it'll be able to correct for atmospheric distortion, and it has around 256 times the gathering area of the Hubble Space Telescope. And, according to the ELT specifications, would provide images 16 times sharper than Hubble, and it was, uh, it was originally called the European Extremely Large Telescope, or the EELT, but they shortened that name down in 20, 2017. So today, my guest today is Dr. Thomas Frommer. He is working on the adaptive optics that will be used at the ELT, and he joins us to talk about what AO is as well as what it's good for. So before I bring him up, I just want to mention that the Telescope Talk Pro Hangouts are brought and sponsored by the... Uh, uh, OPT Telescopes, a world leader in telescopes and accessories for, for both amateurs and professional astronomers. So I want to thank them for making these Hangouts possible. Okay, let me bring up my guest here. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. Now, you are currently in Munich. So you're six. it's six hours ahead and it's 9 p.m. So thank you for being with us late at night. And I know you're probably looking to <laughs> relax a little bit. So I want to thank you for taking time out to talk with us. <laughs> nope. Nope. Um, so just so you guys know, I'm streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and uh, Periscope, and I'm looking at your comments now. So if you've got any questions or comments for Thomas, please let us know, and I will read them out as we go along. So let's, we've talked about the ELT before, the EELT before. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use the long form. Um, and we know that it's being built now. Can you give us an update on how things are going? What's going on right now with the EELT? I'm well, sorry, the ELT. Going, uh... Well, things are going uh, very well. Uh, we make progress on all uh, corners, I would say. Uh, there's a lot of uh, contract follow-up currently going on uh, in ESO Garching. On the other side, we are already pouring concrete on Sarah um, So um, things are going very well, and we are very busy right now in, in Garching, in Munich, in Munich. Yeah, it's being built now up in Atacama, the Atacama Desert. Now, how far away is it? Do you know? from Alma, which is also up there? Is it near Alma? It's not that, uh, it's about a six hour uh, car ride uh, through the desert uh, to go from uh, the place where uh, there were several Amazonas, but the ELT will be built uh, to Alma. Okay. But the Cerro Amazonas is very uh, close to Cerro Paranal, where the other optical telescopes. That's are. right. You want, yeah. That's right. ESO's got a lot of telescopes up in Paranal. So um, that's also, very busy place. So I've been to Cerro Tololo where they have the Blanco, the Blanco four meter telescope at CTIO. What's it like at the Anacama Desert? Is it scary up there? Have you been? <laughs> oh yeah, I've been many times. Uh, actually, <laughs> week, actually, one week from now, I'm, I will be up there again. Oh, you're heading up there soon. Okay. Yeah. Well, I love it. 
I, yeah. I have to say, I really, really love this desert uh, area. I mean, the different uh, colors of red uh, you can imagine in a, in a sunset. It's, it's just beautiful. It's completely different. Uh, it's that's true. Completely they completely different that you would never experience somewhere else. Yeah, they don't they don't pick that site for nothing, do they? I mean, there's some that's no, that. no, it is it is dry. It is very dry. <laughs> that's a Lips good are cracking and uh, you know. Uh, when I stood up there on those peaks and looked up, I mean, I was I'm from the northern hemisphere. I had spent all of my mm -hmm. life here. I knew where the Big Dipper and I know where all the constellations are in the northern hemisphere, but I was lost down there. I was looking yeah. up the most amazing and striking thing about the southern hemisphere are the large and small Magellanic clouds you can see both of those uh, yeah with nothing yeah. you just and look the Milky up. Way because in the southern hemisphere you are actually watching towards the center of the Milky Way and therefore there are so many more stars and it's way more dense compared to the northern hemisphere absolutely stunning it's just yeah. amazing down there so the ELT is yeah. being built right now 40 40 meters that's a bit and it's got segmented mirrors yeah. just like what JWST has uh, only way bigger yeah. and um so the uh w how's the schedule going do you know i mean are we still on when do you expect it to be finished and when it's expected to open up and see first light well currently uh, we are thinking of having first light at the end of uh, 2025 i think it's november uh, 2025 uh, this is the schedule we're aiming for and it looks uh, so far uh, very well 2025 okay uh Okay, I'm just reading some comments from Uncle B, and Uncle B says we're okay. We're fine. I'm just sorry. I got sometimes, but th that's the nature of this beast, Thomas. Sometimes I'm <laughs> listening, and other times I'm looking at, at chats, and I and I'm I'm like, what's going on here? So uh, there was, um, there were the biggest. Um, sometimes I get distracted. So, um, all right. Well, let's talk about your role here. Let's talk about what you're doing. I'd like to start off we've i've mentioned the word adaptive optics i said ao but i did not define it can you tell for people yeah. watching what ao is okay i mean uh, you already mentioned that we are going to the these high sites uh, in the atacama desert because of the dry and very dark skies however there's another big advantage and that's very because it's very close to the pacific that means we are getting laminar flow from uh, the west winds and that means we have not a lot of optical turbulence in the air. I think you all know uh, when you have a hot day and look at a black street, uh, you, you see the flimmering, uh, uh, well, you see it not very uh, very clear what is behind that because it's all, all, all flimmering and that's exactly what uh, causes the starlight uh, on the last 10 kilometers in the atmosphere after it was <laughs> going on for so long and the last 10 kilometers uh, in the hour atmosphere are distorting the wave front that means that it's the star is blinking which is beautiful and romantic however the astronomers do not like a blinking star because <laughs> in a long exposure it just means that it smears yeah it's not romantic and, for scientists they don't think that's that's <laughs> no. beautiful so so there's two two possibilities one is going to space there's no atmosphere that's what hubble and all the other space telescopes are doing that's right or you can use adaptive optics and that's the technique that makes the wavefront after it has been distorted uh, as flat as possible again afterwards now this is uh, this, this this sounds like uh, crazy because we all know the atmosphere is uh, you know, changing uh, statistically on a very fast time scale. It's That's right. It's boiling high. almost. If you look at it in high magnification, it's just roiling and boiling all over. Absolutely. And it's about 500 to 1,000 times per second uh, where we would have to actually know what the atmosphere is doing. Wow. And uh, we do have these uh, kind of sensors. They are called wavefront sensors. That, uh, But what we need is a, a bright star in the direction where we want to do our science roughly the same direction. A few arc seconds away is, uh, is, is also okay. So what we are doing is basically we look at a bright star which is close to the science object that we are actually interested in. And hopefully there's some something around. Now this light also goes through the atmosphere and we are sensing with our wavefront sensor in this millisecond, so every thousands of a second, what uh, the atmosphere is currently doing to the light. And then we analyze it and send it to a de deformable mirror. That's actually a very thin glass sheet, uh, by less than two millimeters, and there's many actuators in the back. And we are actually actively you know, counteracting our mirror such that the wavefront that comes in is then flat again afterwards, after this mirror. And where are the actuators again? Where did you say they were? 
they, they are behind this this very thin uh, sheet of glass. And that sheet of glass is located where in relation to the primary and secondary? Okay, so this is this is now different on many. There's AO systems where the, this deformable mirror is inside an instrument, and the telescope is just a classic uh, uh, three mirror design uh, telescope. Or uh, that's what, exactly what we did in uh, 2016. Uh, we equipped one of our UT uh, unit telescopes on Cerro Paranal. There's the eight meter telescopes, and one of them we did equip with a deformable secondary mirror. Now, this is a one meter diameter uh, sheet of glass of less than two millimeters with many, many actuators in the back, which is actually hanging every night uh, in the wind. This is a beautiful piece of technology. And, uh, and this is what's currently being used on Paranal. This is on, correct on, 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 one, on one of the telescopes. Okay. But there's AO instruments all over on the other unit telescopes as well. And they use like smaller deformable mirrors, which are inside our instruments, like the cameras or spare. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you just said. So I may say some of the things a second time, but your the goal here is to remove the effects of the atmosphere entirely as if you're in space, because it ruins the image. It spreads out yeah. the signal. So you want as bright uh, and pinpoint a signal as possible. So to remove that atmosphere you need a yeah. bright star now if there were a bright star in the field of view you could use that but exactly. you don't always have that on some of these dim objects so you use a laser beam yeah. the laser yeah, shoots correct. out into the atmosphere gives you a yeah. reference point that that light comes back down into the telescope and somehow has information in it well it's distorted by the atmosphere and so exactly. that the yeah. way in which it's distorted is somehow detected and then compensated for what did you say 500 to a thousand times every second yes so yes. About a thousand hertz the atmosphere yeah this is just how, how fast the atmosphere is changing so we are running the system usually at around a kilohertz yeah Wow. So, uh, so at a kilohertz you're having to do this to make these tiny corrections now here's the part I'm confused about on Paranal, on one of the UTs, you have a sheet of glass that you said is about a meter wide yeah. that you can distort to basically compensate or uncorrect yeah. or correct for the distortions, make it flat or make the plane flat. I don't yeah. know. I, I can't picture where that's happening. Is it happening before the light gets into the optical tube or is it happening uh, okay. before it gets into the instrumentation? I mean, it's, it's a meter. Oh. So it's got to yeah. be... Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's one of the three uh, big mirrors. It's actually the secondary mirror. So, so the light comes on our primary mirror, the eight meter. Okay. Then gets uh, collimated, uh, not collimated. It, it gets uh, bent up uh, such that we hit the one meter secondary, and that is like high up there, about uh, ten meters higher than the the primary, where the deformable secondary sits, and then it gets reflected to the next one, and then it goes like the normal train to the instruments. Okay. All right. Uh... Now, for the ELT, this is slightly different. You're not. Mm -hmm. you, you're saying that the the uh, deformable optical element is in the instrumentation, correct? No, no. Oh, I, I had that wrong the, too. The, <laughs> no, there's uh, there's other instruments on Paranal that have this deformable mirror inside. Like oh, is that what I heard? Okay, all right then. Yeah. No, the the, the ELT will, uh, will have. Uh, you all know it's not a three mirror design where the like the uh, conventional telescopes that we are using, like the UTs uh, on Paranal, but it is a five mirror design. Five mirrors. And five mirrors before uh, before the beam is sent out to the Naismith uh, to to the side uh, ports of the telescope. Okay, I didn't have time, folks, to get a bunch of um, diagrams together, but you need to look this up on ESO's website. They have all of this to talk about the design okay. and the optical layout of of the observatory, but. Yeah. Uh, so, so in any way, uh, so the fourth mirror of these five mirrors is the one that is the adaptive one, and that's an even impressive size because it's 2.4 meters uh, in diameter. So the, uh, we, how we are doing it, we are not doing it in one thin piece of glass anymore. We are actually making six petals like a cake, and 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 we bring this six petals together, and then there's five thousand actuators behind these uh, six petals, and but in the thin sheet of uh, glass, and this will be then the deformable mirror for the ELT. How do you do this in a way that the actuators aren't in the way? 
aren't in the way. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Oh, this is reflect. Is this a reflective element? Yeah, that yeah, is being yeah distorted? this is a mirror. Okay, that's that explains it. Okay, good. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I'm imagining yeah. for some reason oh, no worries, no worries. A, a trans a, a transparent thing that is being distorted, and and yeah. that's not what's happening. It's a reflector. It's a reflective yeah. element. Well, okay. How? So this is operating at a thousand hertz. How good can you do? I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, how how can you do as good as if you're in space, or will there always be some some limiting? issue that this de this depends heavily on the wavelength we are observing and where the astronomers would like ah, to let's let's talk about that what is the wavelength range under which this is designed yeah. to operate i mean we are we are operating uh, as you have said at the beginning uh, optical telescopes in the um, in the optic in the visible range from 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers or 800 nanometers mm -hmm. but also in the near infrared and infrared so that goes then up to uh, several uh, microns uh, depends on the exact instrument where they go five microns some, sometimes 10 microns uh, or even or even beyond into the mid infrared but uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken the ELT goes uh, not that far okay and, anyway the longer the wavelength is the easier is it to correct the, the atmosphere for oh really and so so the infrared's easier than say blue optical <laughs> blue oh yeah optical um, Adaptive optics is a real art still, and um, and by, uh, we get by far not, not the corrections uh, as easy and as good as in the band around, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, two microns or so. Okay. All right. So that's good news, so because infrared is where everybody's mostly interested anyway. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's the entire wavelength range, which is important in order to get all the spectra for the for the important stars and galaxies. Uh, but but of course, the infrared is an extremely interesting place. Uh, yes. Well, that's why so many telescopes are located there because it's so dry. There's very little water vapor yeah. in the atmosphere. So mm -hmm. are you able, it sounds like you're able to approach uh, what is possible in space then. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what I said at the beginning that uh, with the ELT having now a 40 meter or 39.3 meter uh, primary mirror, this is, will never happen that we can launch something like that in space and and one other aspect of from ground based astronomy of course is that it's way easier to exchange uh, an instrument uh, in case new science comes up and we need to uh, react and we need to look differently very true i sometimes have a hangout with a friend of mine his name is jeff cooney works at university of hawaii and he makes this point all the time he goes i don't you simply can't do in space what you can do with some of the ground-based observatories with adaptive optics. He goes, you know, it's just too yeah. expensive. So these 40 meter telescopes, he's proposing building a, a telescope that will directly image exoplanets. And his telescope is, is of, of a similar scale, you know, and, and while yeah. I've talked to people who dream about building extremely large telescopes in space that would deploy and launch and unfold and all kinds of various and sundry yeah. ways, uh, it's so expensive to get those photons yeah. that out there. Yeah. And of course, in some wavelengths, you have no choice, do you? I mean, if you want to look in the UV, for example, or if you want to look in x-rays, you've got to go to space. But <laughs> but uh, for yeah. the optical and near-infrared wavelengths, the, uh, ground-based observing um, or yeah. observatories yeah. are the way to go. And, uh, Yet there are still some uh, areas in the in the spectrum, uh, so where the atmosphere, <coughs> excuse me, where the atmosphere is still uh, opaque, and that's why, for example, uh, JWST is, it is very important. It's great that uh, they're going to launch uh, hopefully soon now, and have this amazing uh, instrument soon in space and will. Right, John Suffle was making the uh, joke early in the chat. He, he's one of the he's one of our viewers. He said, "So 2025 is first light. That'll be before JWST, JWST launches then." <laughs> <laughs> because we're all sick no. of waiting. We're just sick of waiting. And no. we and I have people who actually don't soon, believe right? it's going to launch. 2020 or something. 2021, like March 2021. Yeah. And I I don't think anybody I'm... believes they're going to make that now. I mean, it's uh Hello? Did I lose you? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh-oh, he's frozen. Hello? Are you there? Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. All right. Well, hopefully he will just rejoin the Zoom meeting. Oh, there he goes. Ooh, look at me now. I'm in a strange 
This is what I do. Okay, I'm going to leave it this way uh, in case he comes back. So let me read a couple of your comments. Larry Keys, a guide star is also needed. Yes, that's, but as we pointed out, the, the there's not always a bright star in the field of view that you're looking at. If you're looking at a distant galaxy with a field of view where it's very tiny, um, you don't always have a bright star, so you have to manufacture your own, and they use lasers for that. Um, let me go way back here. Oh, here he comes, I think. He's trying to get back on. Condor Boss, how close to the theoretical limit do the adaptive optics bring the telescope? That's a good question, and I'm going to get to that. I don't know the answer, but I I think what you're referring to is once you've removed the limitations of the atmosphere, you're down to the limitations of the optics, and how close does this bring you? My experience has been that this uh, that this brings you right at the diffraction limit of the telescope. But we'll ask him. Uh, there you go. So 2025 before JWST gets launched then, right? Uh, I'm not sure if I see him. Let me go over here. Are you there, Thomas? Oh, it looks like he had a connection issue. Oh, darn it. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going all the way back to the beginning of the chat. He keeps getting kicked out for some reason. Okay. The real Hubble is Sophia. Uh, Opus Borges. Really? You're gonna you, you're gonna you're gonna bomb my chat with comments like that. He's like, Hubble does not exist. Oh, dude. Um, so we got, okay. Uh, Larry Keese, are the lasers affecting the image development? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Larry. Can you be more specific? Um, the image development. No, he keeps getting kicked out. He keeps trying to join. Huh. Uh, let me see if he's trying to email me. Sorry, folks. I'm really sorry this happened. But um, let me see here if he's... No, he hasn't sent me an email. Something must have happened on his end. Uh, let's see. Philip Dub... Okay. Well, I'm sorry, folks. I'm not quite sure what happened to him. Um, uh, I'll just read some of the comments. Hopefully, he'll come back soon. Hi, Galaxia. Hi, James Dugan. Peter Q's back. Remember, you can only correct over... Oh, this is Charlie. You can only correct over a small area, the isoplanetic patch area. This is usually only a few arc seconds in diameter. Um yeah, I can't comment on that. I've never actually used adaptive optics in this way, so I don't know how big the area is. But why would they need a one meter piece of glass or a piece of uh, mirror to do this with? Um, remember, these are hundreds of, of uh, actuators operating at up to a thousand hertz. So that's pretty that's pretty impressive. There's adaptive optics and active optics. This is from Charlie. The per this person is talking about adaptive optics, which happens to be at the one kilohertz speed. Active optics is is frequently corrected in the primary. That's right, and it's slow. That's right. You can. It's called sometimes. It's also called tip tip tilt, where you can just move both the primary and secondary at a much slower rate. Uh, that's active optics, and that's basically to just overcome any just main, you know like uh, coma or things like big distortions, things like that. But yeah, we're talking at actually correcting for atmospheric refraction at different areas along the image plane. And that needs to happen very quickly because if anybody who's looked up and seen a star twinkle, you know it happens at a pretty fast rate. Uh, okay. 
Let's see. Okay. The uh, Larry Keese, the AO tuned to the frequency of light of. Um, so there's, uh, if you're talking about the adaptive optics, it's probably tuned to the frequency of the laser, whatever that is. So they tend to use green lasers, I think, uh, for this. Remember, all they're trying to measure is the wavefront, the distortion of the wavefront. They're not trying to measure the image, the light coming through of, say, a distant galaxy. They're just trying to get the image of the laser beam so in a way that they can uh, measure its shape and correct for it. So the adaptive optics is tuned for that wavelength, whatever the laser is. I don't know. I was going to ask him. But um, uh, the instrumentation, the science instruments are tuned for whatever wavelength they're looking at, whether it be near infrared or uh, the optical wavelengths, which is what the uh, ELT is designed for. Uh, Condor Boss, this is a good question. Uh, at one kilohertz with 5,000 actuators on a 2.4 meter mirror, that's a lot of manipulation. Is there a risk of inducing harmonic vibration? A great question. I wish he was here. I, I don't know what to do. Um, let me just see if I can... Uh, let me go back to my email. Here he goes. He sent me some messages. Uh... Let's see, he's having trouble connecting. <laughs> Isn't this fun watching me email? Okay, he's uh, he says he's only getting a spinning wheel. He's trying to connect, but the wheel keeps spinning. So I just asked him what browser he's using. Kind of worked for a good long time. I don't know why it suddenly died. I mean, we've been on for he was on for forty five minutes before it crashed. Okay. Uh, Oh, Opus, you're on Twitter. That's what you're doing. I see. Okay. Opus Borges. Yeah, you guys can't see him. He's on Twitter. It's a good thing you can't see him. He'd make you mad. Um, how many pixels wide will an exoplanet be? Well, that depends a lot on <laughs> what, what image scale you're using and what, what uh, telescope you've got in the field of view of the telescope. Uh yeah, the ExoLife Finder uh, was designed specifically for multi-pixel imaging. So that's that's the point I was trying to make. You need to match the camera or the instrument with the focal length of the of the telescope that you're using to get the kind of signal that you need. And what those numbers are depends a lot on the configuration. So in the case of the ELT with a 40 meter primary and a field of view of how whatever it is, I don't know what the wavelength or what the focal length is. Um, you can put instruments on the back designed to get you multi-pixels for whatever uh, you're looking at. So, um, but again, it's very, it's very telescope specific. And in the case of ExoLife Finder, they had designed it specifically for that. Uh, I wonder who his ISP is. Well, he's in Germany, so it's probably way better than the ones I have. Um, I have a choice of one. One ISP. I'll tell him Chrome seems to work best. Safari sucks for these things. All right. Nope. Hello? Ah, there he go. is. Wow. Woo. Phew. What happened? Was it the browser? I don't know. I don't know. I used the same browser as before as well. Uh, it was just gone. That's so weird. Well, I'm glad you're <laughs> back because we got some great questions while you were gone. And okay. uh, I wanted to, I didn't know the answer to them. So I was, I was going through some of the chat comments. Um, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, here's Condor boss has a good question, uh, that I, I wanted to get your answer to at one kilohertz 
with 5,000 actuators on a 2.4 mirror meter mirror, that is a lot of manipulation. Is there a risk of inducing harmonic vibration? Oh, uh, we're not uh, moving this glass around like by, by huge amounts, like we're talking uh, uh, some several tens of microns. Uh, oh, that's a good point. Sure. So you're not and, worried about uh, any kind of vibrating or noise, electronic noise? No, because every, every actuator is also doing something different um, every millisecond, basically, and going in a different direction and the, in the diff at a different uh, uh, range. And, and therefore, uh, we do worry, of course, about vibrations on the ELT on every single piece. And also, there's, there are some requirements that we have to fulfill. And then the companies who build us, uh, who build all that, uh, have to fulfill. But uh, it's under control. Okay. All right. And Larry Keys is asking, and, I, and I've asked for clarification, but, and I, I'll tell you what, what I asked, answered, but uh, he is asking, um, is the AO to, what, what is the frequency of light that the AO is tuned to? And I said that it was probably the laser since that's what the adaptive optics wants to measure, but maybe you have, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, uh, we are uh, analyzing the light of uh, either a bright star or the laser guide star which is then going to the atmosphere and this is the distortion that we are actually measuring right and then we are co then we are correcting uh, sometimes not even, well a, a bit even on a, on a different path and then for an object that we might look at a different wavelength so the, the, that is an issue and then there's uh, but uh, it is under control this is usually uh, taken care of by the instrument itself. Sure, sure, so that it, makes sense. Well, so you're not going to... It really depends, uh, basically. Uh, on the laser, it's uh, because we're using this orange laser, it's uh, indivisible, and we have the wavefront sensors tuned to exactly that uh, wavelength. It's the 589 nanometer. It's the famous sodium uh, uh, D2 line that we are exciting. They're very high up in the atmosphere. That's actually also very interesting, by the way. Oh, that's the right. Laser. Yeah, talk about that. You're exciting the atmosphere as well with these lasers. Yeah, so so a laser guide star is actually a star that we are uh, exciting at the very outermost uh, edge of the atmosphere at about 90 kilometers, 100 kilometers. Luckily, uh, micrometeorites are raining on us every day, like uh, between 2 and 10 tons. Uh, it's not yet uh, very clear, actually, how much material rains on the Earth on every day. And uh, usually on the normal meteorites uh, of that size, about 0.6% uh, uh, material is sodium. There's also other metals like potassium or iron, but, but also uh, sodium. And sodium uh, is a lot up there in this area between 90 and 100 kilometers. Below there is uh, oxygen that takes the sodium out, so there's no metal uh, sodium anymore. And above, uh, sodium exists only in, uh, in form of ions. Uh, so only in this region, there is where sodium sits, and that's what creates then for us uh, basically a cigar-like uh, shape. So that's how you... Wow, that, okay, I learned a new thing today. So that's how you decide where in the atmosphere you're going to take the measurement of the wave front, aren't you? Well, no, 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 this is only where we create it, and we don't decide, but we are just lucky that the sodium sits there quite high up, because we, the higher, the better for us, because the okay. light has then to go through the same... Uh, part of the atmosphere. Wait a minute. Well, are, are, are you sure about that? The higher, the better? Because it seems to yeah. me like you've got, you've got a wave front at some altitude, whatever it is. Isn't that going to change? Further oh, down? Oh, we, we, we just need a light that has to go through the same atmosphere where it comes from. I mean, a natural guide star is always better than a laser. Ah. I mean, if, if, if it travels millions and, and billions of years, that's also okay for us. We just, <laughs> need, bright, we just need bright light that we can analyze uh, <laughs> A thousand times a second, basically. That's uh, so oh, all different sense and know what they're doing. I see. So yeah. when you can get a, gui a guide star in the field of view, you use that because it's better. Yeah. In, in addition, uh, exactly. The oh, laser basically addition. helps to get like the coverage all over the sky. Okay. This, the, this is this is the added value. And in addition, the correction because sometimes we don't have not, not only have one, but currently on the on uh, one of the unit telescopes in the VLT, we we are actually using four lasers at the very same time in order to correct for a uh, larger field of view. Mm. Uh, this is then done with a uh, laser to tomographic uh, uh, techniques and other things like that. And uh, that that helps uh, to, to get an even larger field of view with four lasers. So sometimes there is some bright uh, laser, uh, a natural guide star anyway around, but only one, and then we use the lasers in addition. Okay. Uh, this becomes quite complicated in terms of there's many wavefront <laughs> sensors. <laughs> Yeah, and I then the computer imagine. has to figure out how to 
actually command the deformable mirror in the end what to do. Sometimes Holy there's crap. even more than just one deformable mirror. That means if we want to correct very precisely certain areas of the atmosphere, then we, we call the conjugate in optically. That means we put it uh, in the optical train, another deformed mirror, uh, which is then basically mirroring uh, the size of an atmosphere, which is uh, about 10 kilometers high. That's where the jet stream sits. That's where lots of turbulence uh, is, 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 is hurting us. Or the ground layer, the first kilometer just above the telescope. Uh, that would be another idea how to do adaptive optics. Uh, it's, uh, there's many flavors around and every and, and depends on the exact instrument what they actually need if they use uh, this this more uh, you know this design with more deformable mirrors of course this becomes more complicated and more um, um, also more involved into some specifics uh, or uh, we that's what we at the UT for example we are only having this one deformable mirror and we are correcting for the ground layer or the entire atmosphere using the lasers I see depending on the instrument what is, do you know the, the field of view of the ELT, with the, the nominal field of view, or will it change depending on the instrument that's well, being used? Well, uh, the field of view that is being transferred to the instruments in the end, it will be uh, between 4.5 and 5 arc minutes. Oh, wow. That's pretty big. That's bigger than I thought. So, so the... And, go, go, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, but the, the entire field that uh, the ELT is actually transferring towards the Naismith platform is even 10 arc minutes. Mm. But we are using this, this outer ring from, from a diameter of 5 arc minutes to the 10 arc minutes. Uh, that's called the technical field that, that is used, that we uh, use constantly to control our, our mirror and our telescope. So we have then uh, guide probes. Uh, basically, they're looking at uh, bright stars, which we will find somewhere there, and that tell us... Uh, how well the telescope is doing, or if we have to control a bit. Uh, there's so many control loops you wouldn't even believe uh, on the ELT. <laughs> I would believe it. To make it uh, so there's a more. there's a technical field and a science field. It sounds like, and the yeah. the technical field is used for well, making sure the instrumentation gets a good good flat field. Exactly. The exactly. Okay, Galaxia wants to know about the co is the color of the laser important? Uh, yes, for example, uh, because uh, I mentioned earlier it was green, but you guys may not be using green lasers. Um, well, we are not using green, but green is another. That, that, that's a completely other technique uh, that uh, is used in laser guides or adaptive optics. This is, uh, but uh, yeah. So there's uh, if we I just talked about the sodium laser guide stars, which are high up in the atmosphere, it's about 100 kilometers, 90 kilometers, and. Uh, the orange is tuned such that we can excite and uh, the sodium atoms uh, that we are then getting via uh, uh, spontaneous emission we, the light back from this atom. So we're actually doing atomic physics up there. We are actually exciting the sodium atoms. Okay. Now, the green laser is a bit different. That, that is using uh, the Rayleigh backscattering of the lower atmosphere at, about, at around 20 kilometers or so. And it, that's a completely different technique, uh, how to do laser guide stereo. Okay. So, but but the, and the green is used because uh, you have like quite uh, the technology available to do it uh, in the green. That's a standard laser. You have lots of light and you can pulse it, and that's that's a lot easier rather than this orange laser. By the way, which uh, we're running like since uh, oh yeah the early two thousands already, but the laser technology has evolved a lot, and ESO has played a, a crucial role in that because um, uh, to have. Re a real turnkey laser it took uh, took a while to, to get it and um, we did a lot of development uh, which is now used throughout uh, actually the world and on, on all major uh, telescopes are now using uh, that laser technology that has, has been uh, developed at ESO then we prototyped it and then we, we, we gave it a company who did their own uh, brain work in addition and then made a beautiful uh, a turnkey laser that astronomers just don't have to think about anymore the laser is there it, it creates a beautiful, bright laser guide star and can be used uh, on demand every night. And that, that was used to be a big problem in all, on all major uh, observatories who had to have a laser engineer and a lot of work just to get some, you know, a decent number of uh, hours or uh, operational hours. And, uh, well, even the consumer lasers have come a long way over the years. What, what's the wattage uh, output of these, later, of these lasers? So these uh, four lasers that we're now using uh, on the telescope uh, are 20-watt lasers. 20-watt lasers? Are they like water-cooled? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, that must pull a lot of power. Oh, uh, on the other side, I mentioned just this company. That, that they made a beautiful job in order that actually the number or the power that is actually used in, in terms of electronics is by far not as high anymore as these huge and very cumbersome lasers in the, from the early days had to use. And now we are, I think, uh, the laser uses 600 watts of uh, electrical power to create 20 watts of uh, op optical oh, power. Oh, yeah, that has come a long way because <laughs> it used to be like you'd have to, for that kind of laser output, you'd have to like call up your power company and say, I'm about to turn on my laser now. Uh, you want to you give me some more juice? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know that. Well, wait a second. So we're all taught nowadays you can buy a two watt laser, a handheld two watt laser, which if, if you ever do this, folks, treat it like a weapon because it's dangerous. But the, yeah. you know, you're not supposed to point it up at the sky. They always tell you don't point these lasers up at the sky. Do you, are, are, are there limited, this is kind of a silly question, but it's a practical one. Do you guys have to worry about airplanes? I mean, you're shooting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, every laser system on an observatory uh, has some, uh, laser uh, you know, safety uh, uh, devices and every observatory has a different technique to de detect airplanes but we have to have this also like for, for us for example to to comply with the Chilean authorities uh, they know we are shooting lasers but we have also um, in, in our case it's it's visual we have two two redundant uh, cameras always looking at the sky and as soon as some movement of a plane is there our laser shuts off right away uh, Okay. Other other observatories have uh, different techniques, but in the in the end, it's all all the same. So in in ESO's facilities, then you guys have software that's looking at the whole sky, and if you see a plane, you immediately shut the laser off. Boy, that would that would suck though if <coughs> you're right in the middle of a really crucial observation and a plane comes flying by and you got to turn it off. Well, so what are you going to do, it's, right? It's okay. It's only astronomy. It's better than we killing. Can, we can it's do only, it an hour later. It's only right? astronomy. It's better than killing people, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never thought about that until just now. So that's that's really an important issue. So. Yeah, yeah, because a twenty watt laser pointing up in the sky that can, and you're if you're a pilot looking down, that can do some serious damage. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, all right, absolutely. well, good. Um, so Benjamin Bowden is asking a very leading question. He is going: Is there a hard limit on how big we can make a telescope? Can we use an entire plane of the Earth? <laughs> Funny <laughs> you should ask that, Benjamin. Did you see <laughs> yesterday's announcement? That's exactly what they've done. They've turned the entire plane of the Earth into a radio telescope to see the black hole that was in the center yeah. of M87. Now, I think what he means, though, is can you use this in optical wavelengths? And you yeah. I, can you use interferometry, do you think, to create a much larger optical telescope? Oh, oh, this, this is what we're doing also with the VLT. Uh, we, we have the possibility... Uh, to actually connect all four eight meter telescopes and to create uh, something like a telescope with a diameter of 130 meters. This is how far the the large you know, the distance of the largest two uh, telescopes, uh, the largest distance, uh, the, the, we call it baseline. Mm -hmm. So this is then called VLTI. This is a different <coughs> way of using our four telescopes and we are actually doing that. And last year there was this huge uh, story <laughs> with the new gravity instrument uh, on the VLTI. So we are actually already doing in the visible and in the in the near infrared um, uh, interferometry with our optical telescopes. Now to the original question, how large can we build a telescope? I have, huh. Let us say that way. It's already a huge effort to, to make a 40 meter telescope and actually to phase all these uh, segments. So you, at the beginning, you said uh, our telescope is segmented uh, and you mentioned JWST in the space telescope, but like the Keck telescopes or the GTC on, on the Canary Islands, they, they also are segmented mirrors. They don't have that many segments uh, uh, of the order of 30 segments they have, while JWST I think is 18. And mm -hmm. the ELT 19, will yeah. have 798 segments, uh, all hexagonal shape. And they all have to be controlled uh, at the same times in order to have like a very flat surface. And same with the TMT; it's got segmented mirrors. So the yeah. thirty, the thirty meter. Telescope. They have the same, same size segments, uh, mm -hmm. so it's around, uh, I don't know, around six hundred uh, segments, maybe, or I don't know the exact number of the TMT. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I don't either, but it's uh, we did a hangout on that uh, a few uh, about last month, I believe. Um, let's see. Um, looks like the uh, lander that the Israelis had sent to the moon has officially failed. They're commenting on that in the comments. Uh, so that's sad. Um, okay. So 
Let's see. Uh, Larry Keese wants to know, are you an electrical engineer or what's your what's your education level? Are you a PhD, oh, if I well, recall right? Well, I started as an aerospace engineer and uh, added physics in my uh, as a second diploma. And um, then it happened that uh, I was going to uh, Vancouver doing my PhD in um, astrophysics, actually, oh, okay. <laughs> at the University of British Columbia. Um, how, uh, I did start in the, I would say, normal astronomy business. Uh, however, then I was uh, quickly uh, changing because a huge uh, the, um, a project came up uh, that guided me towards astronomical instrumentation within the same department. Uh, but then I was uh, basically doing uh, uh, yeah, astronomical instrumentation in my, uh, using the liquid mirror telescope. It's a six meter mercury mirror, uh, which was located about 60 kilometers east of Vancouver in Canada. Six meter mercury so, mirror? Yeah, yeah, it's a spinning mirror. So, so we're spin only right, gonna... Yeah, it's, it was a it was a beautiful telescope. Uh, very cheap, by the way, compared to like a six meter telescope. Usually, with having a glass surface, is very expensive. That's right. Yeah, with, with spinning mercury. Uh, I mean, I did not build it. I just used it. Uh, it was my uh, supervisor, uh, Professor Paul Hickson, who was actually uh, building it by himself up there. It's an amazing telescope, and he even built it for. <laughs> Someone just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I used this telescope uh, to add a laser system, interestingly, to it, because TMT at the time had a, a huge concern about the variability of the sodium layer in terms of adaptive optics. And uh, no one knew what the sodium layer, what I was talking with the lasers before, mm -hmm. is actually doing on timescales that are important to, uh, to uh, adaptive optics, like the, what I said, several tens, uh, several hundreds of hertz. Mm -hmm. Because of our huge telescope, uh, we were able to uh, get uh, geophysics data, basically, but for astronomical use, uh, what the sodium layer uh, was doing on, on timescales that have not been observed before. And um, so I was building a laser system to it and detector system to it. And then I was observing and got uh, great data. And then and, uh, and ESO joined uh, uh, shortly after, and then it was like a joint project between TMT and ESO actually to investigate for astronomical use the sodium layer at high speed. Okay. And so that, that was how I actually got into the whole astronomy business, but I started yeah. as an aerospace engineer student. <laughs> so do you design primarily then, uh, um, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're mostly into the hardware, right? The, the, the optical design and the electronic design of these AO systems. Yeah. When, when I was in Vancouver, I was doing everything basically from, uh, from, 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 from the design work, uh, but also then the whole analysis and, uh, and the whole software part uh, as well that uh, was uh, was a great uh, playground you know, okay. in all areas. You know, sometimes soaked in oil because there was an issue with the compressor uh, that I had to fix, and at, at night, uh, so I could uh, could get a few more you know, hours of data. Vancouver, uh, you know, bright skies are not that uh, that often. No, so no, they're not. To... That's a cloudy part of Canada for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, welcome to uh, Paranor, Paranor and CosmoQuest. Hi, thank you for watching on Twitch and Lady Pembroke also from Twitch. Thank you guys for showing up. Veronica Cure is also there. So thanks, guys. I'm uh, glad you guys are there. My Twitch stream is building, but not fast enough in my opinion. Well, let me just tell you, uh, Thomas, I spent 30 years in the astronomy, um, in the astronomy, uh, professional astronomy realm, as a software engineer, I wrote code that, you know, read images from cameras that processed those images, calibrated those images, controlled those cameras and all kinds of different things. Wow. And I am very interested in software. What kind of, uh, who, well, first of all, what languages do, are primarily used in AO? Is it real time, uh, software that's being written on real time systems or can you give us a glimpse into what kind of software goes into these things? Like what kind of software? I, I don't know. Because you don't know I'm anything about the software? A, okay. I'm expert. But what I do know is we do use, of course, real-time computers that are actually tailored to the exact mathematical uh, problem. And this is basically an, a huge matrix inversion in the end, what it is. Uh, that's right. That's right. You've got a computer matrix and then just run it through yeah. a Fourier transformer. And, and transform we need to make, something. especially with these uh, many wavefront sensors and many actuators, these, this, these matrices are huge. And in order to uh, <laughs> do this fast enough, there's more and more and more tricks. Uh, so in hardware, using GPUs, not the CPUs anymore. Uh, oh, there's really? so many different ideas. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, that but makes also, a lot of, of sense actually, because GPU programming is 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 more for like flow rates instead of you know like uh, the the standard kind of gaming programs that you see where. Uh, you're you're doing if then statements or loops or whatever it is these these GPUs and I've programmed a bit not not a lot but some in GPUs and it's a different way of thinking entirely you yeah, you yeah, don't keep yeah. your you don't keep your computations hanging around you need to move uh, them along and I can see why I can see why you use GPUs yeah. that's a so good this use. is one 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 idea of a technique and which is used but also other ones like using FPGAs rather than CPUs is mm -hmm. also so the to be honest, I, I don't know the details what exactly now on the ELT will be. Oh, used. that's okay. Uh, I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right now actually uh, working uh, on the uh, phasing and diagnostic station. So this will be actually the instrument that verifies the entire ELT once we have the first photons going through. And we are currently in the, in the phase of uh, specifying it. And soon we will actually start our design phases. And this will be an ex extremely interesting uh, instrument for, uh, because it will be, you know, the first light images that you will see eventually, uh, you know, in the public will come from this uh, this 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 uh, box, <laughs> and and we will use to verify the telescope to get to know the telescope uh, to understand all all these different control loops to control the 798 segments plus the deformable mirror plus uh, all our other mirrors that are all on uh, on controlled uh, actuators because one one should not forget the ELT is so huge that it cannot be built stiff anymore i mean the stiffness of a VLT or CAC light telescope is is by far stronger or more than uh, any of the ELTs that are now currently being built this would be just way too much steel that's not handleable anymore so how we deal with it we have all the mirrors on actuators and constantly controlling them such that we get like the best possible image on in, into our instrument. Well, that's a good point because um, we were talking when you were trying to reconnect the difference briefly, and I gave a very crappy answer to the question, but there's a difference between adaptive optics, which operates on these frequencies of, of 500 to a thousand Hertz, yeah. but the, there's, a, there's also something called active optics, which is what yeah. you're talking. When you move these primary segments, that's more of an active optic uh, situation. Yeah, this is exactly there. There we are compensating for gravity effects. And uh, one should think this flexure huge. when, when we are following a star uh, changes the gravity vector on all our optics, which has an impact because we, we do care about the, a very smooth surface on the, hundreds of nanometers, sometimes tens, depends on the obser observations, tens of nanometers uh, level, and that everything counts, even the pressure waves of a wind blowing over the segments, uh, co you know, that all has to be controlled. And uh, so the active optics, or how we call it, the low order loops are running uh, on a way slower uh, speed, yeah. but, constant, but constantly, we have to constantly update the all our actuators basically that's right and have you guys ever noticed that that observatories aren't being built like they used to be they used to be like yerkes and and uh some of these old refractors that are around now that we can go to were built in these silos that were sometimes even made out of stone uh, but they had these metal domes those days are gone now if you look at a modern observatory what you see is a gigantic barn looking square thing with all these doors and vents on it that's so that they yeah. can get that air moving through there and they want a minimum, they want shelter, but they don't want so much shelter that they, you know, that the atmosphere inside the observatory yeah. is di completely different from that in the outside. As an example, I went to the University of Colorado where we had the Summers Bosch Observatory and the University of Colorado wanted every building to look alike. And what did they build those buildings out of? beautiful expensive flagstone that was absolutely gorgeous but it radiated all night long so yeah. <laughs> there was for the observatory it was terrible so yeah. uh it do you have much now with modern telescope design and with the elt especially um this do you have to compensate with ao systems for dome seeing or is that just not an issue anymore Oh no no it is it is always an issue and okay uh, so it's not all, completely all the of course helps helps immensely uh, um, you know the least we need to correct for the the better that's also why we're still going to the Atacama desert and not just building it and we we're saying we have AO we could correct uh, no matter what no no <laughs> no AO is so hard uh, that uh, 
<laughs> everything, every little turbulence that is not around <laughs> definitely helps uh, to, to the ground-based astronomy. And therefore, dome seeing is still an issue. And we have very hard requirements on all our electronic cabinets, for example. They all water-cooled. Nothing is allowed to be uh, by X amount of degrees uh, large, uh, you know, uh, warmer than uh, the ambient temperatures. We even have a huge air conditioning system inside the dome that makes uh, that that that, that uh, creates the temperature that is foreseen for the next night. For example, so our mirrors are all on the correct temperature when we start the observer. Uh, oh, I did not know started. that. That's interesting. So, so the, this, during this the daytime, actually, you mean you turn on these air conditioners? Oh yeah, to oh, keep yeah, yeah, it yeah. to keep it cold in there. To keep it cold. So it's actually very freezing if you <laughs> have to walk in there. <laughs> it's cold so up there as it is. <laughs> <laughs> inside because it's the nighttime temperature right which is <laughs> well, do you, right so but, uh and, and you want that because you can get these materials that, that you know glass if it's made of glass or primaries are made of glass you've got these metal trusses all made of whatever they're made of what what uh is the elt using for things like this like are they using i don't know titanium or or some kind of special expensive metals or what are they using to build? i mean i mean uh, for those living uh, in uh, or for those interested in football i don't know if you know but uh, we're talking about something of the size of a uh, football stadium in, in munich like the allianz arena which where where fc bayern is playing we're talking about a huge huge building in the desert so of course we cannot use uh, some fancy material because uh, we're talking about thousands of tons of uh, material and therefore no we just use normal steel what we do take care is about the, the exact painting. Do we want to have it high emission? So it, 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 you know, it doesn't take, uh, it takes just the ambient temperature and it's not colder when it looks at the sky. Or maybe for some areas we need black because we don't, we want to keep the stray light under control if there's the moon up, for example. I mean, it really depends on the area, which color we are using, but but it is it is steel. <laughs> I yeah. mean, of course, the mirrors the, the mirrors are made out of glass. And it's it's different and coated uh, than sure. the way we do it with a special silver coating. But for most of the mirrors, not all. But uh, but but the rest is steel. Okay. Well, Strawberry Jesus Eleven is a streamer participating in the talk. I think so. I'm trying to participate. Uh, so I think I'm here. I hope I hope you are still there. Um, Andrew Planet is asking. Let me see what his question is. Of the limits of gravity and a, on. A, Okay, of the limits of gravity on a land telescope, could we build an even larger, extremely large telescope in space one day? Uh, yeah, and we mentioned that earlier, Andrew Planet. They There are plans to make these, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 meter scale space telescopes. Um, yeah. They're calling them all kinds of things, but uh, I think the advanced technology solar telescope was one, and then that changed that to something else. But yes, but of course the limitations are weight uh, and and how you're going to get it all up there, and you're going to fold it up in some kind of weird origami like they are at JWST, yeah. or you're going to do multiple launches. But no matter what, you're talking about a huge expanse. And is that expanse worth what you're going to get out of that primary mirror objective size and depending on who you ask jeff coon for one he's gonna say no <laughs> he'd rather you build a really really large ground-based telescope uh the problem of course is that only works at wavelengths where the atmosphere can be overcome and short wavelength astronomy high energy astronomy like x-rays cosmic rays ultraviolet you really have no choice. You can't do that from the ground. But uh, most things you can. There's a there's a region in the infrared you can't do on the ground because of water vapor. But you can minimize that by going to places like Chile. So, um, Strawberry Jesus, I don't even remember how I followed this channel, but it's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm trying to grow the Twitch presence here, but I appreciate your comment. I don't know what to do with Twitch, to be honest with you. But uh, I do stream all of these Hangouts on Twitch just in case. Um, okay. Well, we are, <laughs> wow. We're out of time, Thomas. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to thank you so much for taking time out. I know it's late in Germany. Uh, my guest today was Dr. Thomas Frommer. He is a scientific, uh, he is an astro astronomical instrumentation scientist working on the adaptive optics on the extremely large telescope, which is being built right now in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and it's looking like things are going on schedule, right? For a 2025 first light, yep. is that right? Things are 
Yeah, I mean, we we, we hit, did have some hiccups uh, last year, the year before, uh, but but uh, so far it looks very very good, and we are all working very motivated and enthusiastically and and and, and to meet this deadline. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, Mike Rosaire want to know wants to know, well, Mike Osair, or is it Mike Osair? I don't know. Um, uh, will the average Joe be able to visit the ELT? Can just anybody go up there? I mean, the Paranal can be visited every, I think it's the first weekend in a month uh, in, in Chile. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we do have some visitor galleries foreseen in the dome where uh, I think visitors in principle could uh, walk around. I doubt it will be in the first five years. We will have uh, right. so many things still, still to finish up and whatnot and make it uh, ready for the night that... Yeah, you I don't think at the very beginning, but uh, but I, I all I know is that, that we do have a visitor, uh, 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 an outreach uh, people center. around, and we, we we do welcome our visitors on on Cerro Paranal on on the VLT. So eventually, for sure. It will oh be. yeah, I mean, ESO has some of the best outreach I've ever seen. I mean, it it rivals anything NASA does, if not that way better. I love what ESO does with their outreach. And yeah, you guys are hosting, I think, a big observing party uh, for the eclipse coming up in Paranal. So yeah. that's in, when is that, August? or I forget, It's later this year. Yeah, um, I forget when it's year. happening. Uh, and there was one more quick question from... Uh, oh, uh, from Condor Boss, and I'll then I'll, I'll, I'll then I'll let you go. I promise. Uh, yeah. Could the ELT be twinned like Keck? Can you get two of them working? To <laughs> I, I don't. It was think hard enough to build one, one, but let's say you could build two. I, I don't think that there's room on this mountain to, to build another. Year. <laughs> You're getting in general. If, if we would have the money and the manpower, uh, sure, a second one in principle could be built. Maybe on a second. Uh, mountain close by to Sierra Amazonas, although I think it's the highest one uh, around in this area. Anyway, uh, so I have not heard of any plans. <laughs> yes, and I yeah, and I will close with uh, Strawberry Jesus Eleven. Is it going to be more powerful than orbital telescopes? I think I've heard of some incoming projects like that. Uh, not sure. Uh, this is going to be more powerful, certainly more powerful than Hubble. And if JWST gets launched, it might be on par with that. But it would be, depends on what you mean by powerful and what wavelengths you're looking at and things like that. So exactly. Strawberry Jesus, the solving power in, in principle with AO will be uh, on on paper better than uh, JWST. One has to see then afterwards. Uh, yeah, what that actually means, but. Uh, Look, it's astronomy. It's not. It's um, It's uh, we 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 are collaborating with our, all our colleagues around the world in order to make these things, like from the TMT, and uh, we are in the reviews. And there's a that's a great exchange. Uh, I don't see it as a uh, rivalry actually at all. Okay, but this is my my personal opinion. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, and I will I, I will post the uh, link to Discord, Lady Pembroke, on Twitch as soon as this is done. I want to thank you, Thomas, for taking time out. Thomas Frommer from ESO, uh, from the ELT collaboration, work, talking to us about the uh, adaptive optics capability on the telescope. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, Thomas. I hope you'll come back as maybe as the date gets closer and tell us how things are going. And uh, yeah, it's been great. And thank you for agreeing. I know it's so late. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the stream here, folks. I want to thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Ciao. Ciao. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. That is it. Yeah, sorry about uh, for this hiccup. I oh, that's, what happened. that is quite all right. It's, uh, I understand. And I'm sorry.